Welcome everyone back uh, to our virtual herpetology conference, Management for Reptile and Amphibian Survival. Katie Greenwald from Eastern Michigan University is going to talk about environmental DNA assessment reveals restoration success for mud puppies. Um, so I'd like to just really thank Ellen and Pierce Cedar Creek for the opportunity to talk with you today. This has been a fantastic conference so far. I've really, really enjoyed it. So thank you all for, for organizing. Um, and I wanna be sure here at the start to acknowledge my co-authors on this presentation. Uh, most especially Jenny Sutherland, who is a former master's student in my lab. She uh, did this work as her master's thesis. So as other uh, PIs may know, that means that I, this is not my project. <laughs> I'm presenting uh, Jenny's really excellent work here. And I also want to acknowledge Dave Mifsud and his team at HRM, who coordinated and conducted um, all of the mud puppy trapping data that you'll see here, which is no small task. So huge thanks. This was a huge project um, that I'm just here to tell you about. <laughs> so, all right. So if I can get my slides to advance, there we go. So my puppies are a really interesting, really cryptic salamander species here in the Great Lakes region and points south. Um, they are as many folks know, fully aquatic salamanders, they really like to hang out under very large rocks. And so that makes them really difficult to survey. They're also, as you'll see, most active in really cold temperatures. So if you wanna bust through some ice and flip some giant rocks in the middle of winter, this is the species to work with. Um, so what this means is that there are some pretty substantial gaps in our understanding of them as well as other cryptic herpetofauna. And that makes effective conservation really difficult for these types of species. We do know um, that in a number of parts of the range, particularly in the Midwest and the upper Midwest specifically, that mud puppies have undergone um, a seemingly fairly precipitous decline over the past um, several, several decades. And there are a bunch of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, contaminants and pollution, things like runoff from agricultural systems, as you see here, um, can have negative impacts on their habitat and, and the amphibians themselves. Human intervention is a particular threat. They are frequently caught by um, ice fishermen and in some cases then not returned to um, their aquatic habitat. They're left on the ice. Some people think they're venomous or that they are eating the target fish species. None of these things are true. Um, and so there, is, there are problems there, as well as, of course, human intervention in terms of habitat modification, as you can see with the, um, this, the picture on the bottom right there, this, this dam that disrupts flow. Um, more dramatic habitat alterations, of course, larger dams, channelization, things like that are all going to impact these aquatic amphibians. And then finally, lamprecide is a huge threat to, um, to the species. This is TFM is a chemical that is applied to aid in the management of the invasive sea lamprey in the Great Lakes region. But unfortunately, it's also fatal to mud puppies. And so there are a number of papers, um, one in particular by Tim Madsen out in Ohio, um, that have shown really large scale die offs uh, related to the application of lamprecide in, um, in the Great Lakes. So why do we care about mud puppies? Well, hopefully I don't have to um, convince this crowd when <laughs> you're all here at a herp conference, so you probably care already. But as we know, many amphibians, mud puppies included, can be really important indicator species as far as environmental health is concerned. They are just out there with no scales, no feathers, right? Um, soaking up everything that's in the environment. And so when we start to see issues with amphibian species, including mud puppies, that can be an indicator that something has gone awry in terms of environmental health. They're also really important ecologically. They are keystone species. They have a really fundamental role in the aquatic food web. And interestingly, they're also the critical and obligate host for a state listed um, mussel species, the salamander mussel, Simpsonius ambigua, which attached to their gills and use them uh, to disperse. They're not harmful. And the main reason for the decline of this species is thought to be 
the loss of their host, the mud puppy. We did our work, um, again, oh, not really me, my many, my many fantastic collaborators along the St. Clair Detroit River system shown here um, in Southeast Michigan. And this is a really interesting um, set of really diverse types of habitat with lots of different potential human impacts in different areas of this system. The St. Clair River and the Detroit River in particular are, are EPA areas of concern. So these are places that have had um, some work done to look at what are sort of the issues that need to be addressed in order to um, remove these, these uh, impairments to these systems. The rivers in particular have been heavily dredged to allow for shipping these really large boats that need to be able to navigate through these waters. And so clearly that's going to impact all sorts of things about the hydrology and the microhabitats and the species that are able to persist in these systems. So what we were able to do um, was take advantage of a lot of um, really great data generated by partners, uh, Fish and Wildlife Surf Service and USGS in particular, um, who would catch mud puppies by accident, just as bycatch when they were out doing their surveys, looking for other target species of fish. And so they were fantastic and would report those to us and share the data. And then, as I mentioned, Dave Mithsud and his crew also did a lot of trapping, specifically targeting mud puppy salamanders along the St. Clair Detroit River system. So this was great because it meant we had a lot of data going into this project on places where we, um, we knew we were expected mud puppies to be, right? So known positive sites. And we also had places such as the Huron River um, where we were fairly sure that they were absent. So this is a location where Dave and his crew had done a lot of trapping and not turned up any mud puppies. And so we had some known positives, some known negatives, um, some places that we just didn't have a lot of information. And so we were able to um, go to those places and look for mud puppies and additionally do the eDNA sampling that I'll tell you about in just a minute. The other thing that was really cool and fortuitous about this project was that we were able to follow up on some restoration work. So a subset of these sites had been targeted for different types of restoration. And uh, these are basically the addition of rocks. So mud puppies love rocks. As I mentioned, they will use them as habitat, as refugia. They will lay eggs um, and guard their nests underneath these large flat rocks. And so re uh, restoration, specifically targeting mud puppies, was done at a number of shoreline sites, as you see in the top left picture here, which was the addition of these large kind of slab-like rocks to create these mud puppy habitat structures. There had also been restoration done to provide fish spawning habitat in deeper waters. That's the reef restoration that you see at the bottom left. And so again, this work wasn't specifically targeting mud puppies, but we thought this could be a neat opportunity to see if restoration for other species might also happen to benefit mud puppies. So the goal of the project was to look at mud puppy presence along the St. Clair Detroit River system. And I'll tell you quickly about three ways that we did this using catch per unit effort calculated from the trapping data, environmental DNA um, sampling as I'll, I'll come back to you momentarily, and how we used occupancy modeling to sort of put all of this information together. We had four main predictions. The mud puppies uh, catch per unit effort would be higher at restored versus unrestored sites. That we would find mud puppy eDNA at places where we also had trapped mud puppies. So that would be our test of whether eDNA was a good way to detect the species. We predicted that detection probability would be higher for eDNA sampling versus other trapping methods. And we predicted that occupancy would be higher at restored versus unrestored sites. So to start at the start, again, we had fantastic data um, from folks at um, USGS and Fish and Wildlife Service. That was the bycatch data, as well as Dave Miss said from, uh, from HRM, there was a lot of trapping done between 2014 and 2016. 
along this system. And the catch per unit effort, we calculated as the number of mud puppies caught per hour that any of the trapping methods were deployed. And these trapping methods included both set lines. These are set along the bottom of the river um, and did have minnow traps also attached to them, as well as minnow traps that were set along the shoreline. So for the uh, sampling targeting mud puppies, those were all shoreline minnow traps. Um, those apparently were, were baited with uh, Colby Jack cheese. This is the favored cheese of mud puppies if you ever need to catch a mud puppy. And here you can see an individual that has been caught in one of those minnow traps. So to jump straight to the results for this part, we didn't find significant differences. There's a lot of variance in the data here in terms of the catch per unit effort, just looking at the trapping data. Um, but you can sort of start to see potentially some interesting patterns here. So it does look like minnow traps. Um, we, we have a trend where, where they had a higher catch per unit effort than the set line. So that may be a better way to look for mud puppies. Um, and it also looks like the restoration sites shown in green um, are, are, or I'm sorry, shown on the, the left side um, of each pair are higher than the control sites. So again, some inkling here that that maybe there's some benefit to the restoration efforts. But we wanted to delve into this more. And so we ended up doing um, some eDNA sampling as well. And just for a very quick bit of background on eDNA for folks that aren't familiar, this is the short for environmental DNA. And this is just DNA that is shed by an organism into its environment. So if you go swimming in a swimming pool, you'll be leaving some traces of your DNA in that swimming pool. And mud puppies are the same. In the case of the mud puppies, um, much of this is likely um, shedding, skin cells, waste, um, decomposition of animals that have died, uh, reproductive output, all of these things are going to lead to the organism's DNA just being present in the aquatic habitat in which it exists. And you can sample water for eDNA, you can sample sediment. Um, there are different protocols. I won't get into the nitty gritty of it here, but um, basically to do this work, what Jenny needed to do was get water samples from all of these locations filter them in order to filter the DNA out of the water sample, and then use that filtered DNA and attempt to um, detect whether it belongs to mud puppies, right? It's going to have lots of other kinds of DNA in there as well. And so when you're doing this type of work, you can use general primers, which are going to basically amplify or allow you to detect all the species that are, that are in there, right? All, of the, all the DNA that's floating around in that system or you can use targeted primers, which are for a particular species or genus or group of organisms that you're interested in. And that's what we did. We used primers that are specific for Nectaris, the genus um, of which this is the only species we have in the area. So these were basically species specific primers for us. And we were interested in looking at whether this was a viable way to detect the mud puppies. So again, we, uh, we had a bunch of great pre-existing data. And so we were able to choose sites from among these places where we either knew they had been successfully trapped or they had never been uh, successfully caught using traditional trapping methods. So um, just as a reminder, the, the St. Clair River, which is where the eDNA sites were, uh, this was listed as an area of concern. Um, one of the requirements to uh, to basically get it you know, delisted, not as an area of concern, is to improve habitat for fish and wildlife. And so this is a great way to think about doing that because again, mud puppies are indicator species. And so if we are able to see that restoration is working for them, that the habitat is improving for them, um, that could indicate that there are also improvements being made for other wildlife species as well. So I will, um, I've, I've kind of shortened up this, uh, this table a little bit here. We actually had 20 sites that we monitored for eDNA. Each of the sites listed here had a number of locations within it. And so as you can see with the trapping detection data, we had four of these locations that had, had mud puppies successfully caught, a couple that had not. 
And the eDNA detection um, was a great match for the trapping detection. All the sites where we had successfully caught mud puppies, we also detected their eDNA when we sampled the water at those locations. Um, Fairhaven boat launch was, was the only mismatch, and this was a place where they hadn't been caught, but we did detect the eDNA. And so that just might be a place where they, they hadn't been caught because sometimes you don't catch things that you're looking to catch. Um, there was a lot of trapping done and, and sampling done along the Huron. And unfortunately, it does look like for most of uh, that river, mud puppies have been unfortunately extirpated, likely due to the fact that there are just a ton of dams along that river. So it's really, really heavily fragmented. So our next prediction was that detection probability would be higher for eDNA sampling versus traditional sampling methods. And for this, I'll give you just a little bit of background. We used an approach called occupancy modeling, which uses trapping data. And it lets you calculate two really important metrics. The first of these is detection probability. And what this is, is just the probability, the likelihood that you will find an individual at a site given that it's there. So as we all know, everyone who's done heart field work, uh, you, don't, you don't catch things every time you try to catch things, right? And so detection probability can get at, um, if you know a species is at a particular location, how likely you are to find it on any given time that you go out looking for it. And it also allows you to calculate occupancy, which is just gonna be the proportion of sites occupied. So this is, again, um, Jenny's very good work that <laughs> I'm showing you here. She dealt with the analysis here. This was in the uh, program presence where you put in all of your data from all of your sites and all of your attempts to find the species. Um, and again, it allows you to think about calculating this detection probability because, for example, if you, if you go someplace and you don't find the species on day one, but then you do find it on day two, the program now knows, okay, well, it, it was there. It's just that you hadn't found it on that first day that you went looking. So again, we included um, all the trapping data here from both the set lines and the minnow traps. And we also calculated detection probability and occupancy using the eDNA data and using replicated sampling from the sites basically as, um, as our, our repeated sampling events. So we were interested in using the occupancy modeling here to look at the differences in detection probability and occupancy um, across the season itself, right? Are there patterns that we see temporally across the sampling methods? So is one better than the others in terms of improving our detection probability, and of course, across restoration status. So is the restoration improving the occupancy um, for mud puppy salamanders? So when we look across the season, we see a really strong pattern with temperature. This had been seen before. This was not overly surprising, um, but it is still pretty pretty striking if you haven't seen it. So what I'm showing you here is surface water temperature on the x-axis and detection probability on the y-axis. And as you can see, there's a very strong relationship between these uh, for both set lines and minnow traps. Once you get above 10 degrees C or so, um, you just are very unlikely <laughs> to detect this species. Whereas if you look at the very coldest temperatures, for both set lines and minnow traps, you have your highest detection probability at the very coldest temperatures. Um, so what this means, again, is if you're doing mud puppy work, it's best to sample very late in the season um, or right away when the ice thaws or cut some holes through the ice and, <laughs> and drop, your, drop your traps right through the ice holes uh, to attempt to find these species. So very strong relationship with temperature. What about sampling method? The sampling method, again, varied. The detection probability varied quite a bit um, with sampling method. What we saw was that the uh, minnow traps had the lowest detection probability. Set lines were significantly higher than that. But eDNA was the highest, significantly higher than either of the kind of traditional trapping methods. We had over an 80% detection probability using the eDNA sampling. Um, whereas the others were below 50 for set lines um, and below 20% for minnow traps. So what this means is that you could potentially uh, sample a much greater number of sites using eDNA 
um, and feel fairly confident that you were detecting the species if it's present. The occupancy estimates didn't vary across the types of uh, sampling that was done. So this is this is a good thing, right? We got the same answer in terms of the total occupancy across all sites for from all of these methods. Um, and you know, 80, 85 percent of sites um, that we that we uh, sampled were occupied. So good that there was no no mismatch there. So our last prediction was that occupancy would be higher at restored versus unrestored sites. So here's that big question, right? Going back to these restorations that had been done. Again, there were the shoreline restorations with the addition of those big slabs of rock. There were also the deeper water reef restorations, which were the ones that were not targeting mud puppies, but we thought maybe they would benefit mud puppies. When we look at the occupancy of those deep water sites, what I'm showing you here is the, the reef ones are the restored, the rock additions at those deep water sites. The non-reef ones are places that had not had restorations. And these are set line data. So that's the little hook at the top is telling us. And these are not different from one another. So we had the same occupancy across sites, whether or not there was restoration. This is for the deep water sites. The minnow trap data told the same story for the deep water sites. So for both reef and non-reef or non-restored reef sites, um, we had the same occupancy regardless of restoration status. So um, the additions of those rocks did not seem to uh, impact whether or not we would find mud puppies at those locations. However, happily, <laughs> The story was different for the shoreline sites. If we looked at the shoreline restoration locations, we had significantly higher occupancy at sites that had undergone those shoreline restorations versus sites that had not. So in the shallow water habitat, the addition of those rock structures really did improve uh, the occupancy for this species. They were much more likely to be found at those locations that had undergone those restoration efforts. So just to um, wrap up, kind of uh, bring it all back together. Again, we used trapping data, calculated catch per unit effort, um, environmental DNA analysis and occupancy modeling to inform our understanding of mud puppy presence along the St. Clair Detroit River system. Um, our predictions we overall did pretty well. Um, we did not find a significant difference between restored and unrestored sites when we just looked at the catch per unit effort data, but um, we did find some important uh, effects there when we used some other methods. Uh, so mud puppy eDNA, our second prediction, uh, we did find a good match between the eDNA and the trapping data. So that tells us that eDNA sampling is potentially a really useful tool for this species. We did find that um, it had higher detection probability than the other types of sampling. Um, and it is also, you know, in some ways easier, I guess I'll, we can leave that for a question at the end, right? The, the actual trapping is a huge amount of, of people power needed, um, right? A lot of travel, a lot of time in the field. Um, so there are costs and benefits to both of these things, but as far as kind of sampling a really wide range of locations, um, eDNA seems like a really effective way to do that. And, you know, lastly, I think the um, probably the, the neatest finding here was that we did get that higher occupancy for those restored sites um, versus the unrestored sites. And so it looks like the restoration efforts here were a success. So last slide here. Again, we recommend eDNA for, for monitoring this species. It seems to be a great way to um, increase detection probability, allow for potentially greater spatial coverage for sampling, and restoration works. So if you have a place that you would like to have mud puppies, <laughs> just add some rocks, right? Add, add the rocks and they will come. Um, these large kind of slab-like rocks with, um, with openings for them to inhabit, for them to uh, use as nesting habitat, um, does seem to be an effective restoration method. So these are overall valuable tools um, to both survey and protect mud puppies. So um, I will just, again, thank uh, a whole host of people. Again, we had great support here, and particularly the 
Um, my co-authors who are bolded again here, whose very good work this mostly is, <laughs> very little to do with this very cool project. And if you'd like really the, the nitty gritty details, um, Jenny published her thesis in Herpetologica um, in 2020, and I'm happy to send this PDF to folks who are interested in, in more information on any of these methods. Um, but I am also happy to answer questions here if we have time. We definitely have time. Thank you, Katie. That was, it's so refreshing to hear a talk where it's like, yes, restoration works. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so that just made me, made my heart happy. Uh, though it seems like uh, Colby Jack cheese and rocks brings right, them in, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I never would have expected. Um, so yes, thank you. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A and while we're asking these questions, feel free to put in more questions either in the Q&A or the chat, or if you're joining on Facebook, which I got it back up, yay. Um, also you can join, uh, ask questions in the comments on that. Um, but one question we had was, or statement slash question, I found a mud puppy in the tip of the thumb in a mouth of a river that spills into Lake Huron. Where would I report this finding? That is a great question. I will make Dave's heart happy now. And I will say <laughs> Michigan Herp Atlas would be a great place to report that. Um, you know, this is, it's just a, such a, a cool species. It's one where the more we can understand about its distribution, um, the better, you know, we have a whole other project I didn't talk about where we did some uh, looking at genetic differences among populations. And we actually found a few locations in Michigan where they're quite genetically differentiated. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. And put it in the herb atlas and help us keep track of where these cool little animals are. <laughs> yeah. And, and both David and I just put it in the chat of uh, miherpatlas.org uh, for Michigan Herp Atlas. And so it's a great place for us to keep track of all these wonderful species. Um, another question that we had was, have you found any issues with the round and I'm never going to pronounce this right, Gobi, <laughs> Gobi invasion and mud puppy abundance. Do you think they compete for similar resources? Gosh, that's a great question. Um, I wish I could unmute Dave and get his take on that question. Um, I don't imagine that they are in any sort of direct competition. Um, David yeah. does say that they are an active predator, at least the mud puppies are. Right, right. That was my thought. You know, they're in, they're going to be in similar sort of microhabitats, right? These kind of bottom, bottom, bottom lands, right? Um, and so, yeah, I would imagine that uh, in particular, you know, gobies will um, lay and defend eggs right on the bottom of the river. And those, those are probably a great snack for, <laughs> for my body. Oh, man. All right. We have another question of, uh, do you ever use luminescent lures when trapping? So like glow sticks? Yeah, I'm not sure if Dave tried that, but we have collaborators um, out in Minnesota that have, and I think continue to. Um, and last I chatted with them, they weren't seeing any strong differences there. That's something that really seems to vary by species and maybe even location. So I do a lot of work with embistomatid salamanders too. And there are a couple papers showing that that can really increase trapping success. And then there are others that, that are working with the same or similar species that don't see any difference. So, um, so that's when at least last I talked to the Minnesota folks, they weren't seeing a really strong impact of, of including those. Use Colby Jack cheese. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we did have David saying that gobies, uh, we use gobies as bait for catching mud puppies. Uh, so that was in the chat, uh, to the previous question. Awesome. Uh, somebody did ask uh, in the Q&A, do you know of an alternative to lampricide when dealing with sea lampreys? You know, slightly different there. But... Yeah, no, I don't. I've, I have a colleague actually who's working on various types of like fish ladders and looking at, you know, how, how different fish species actually move upstream. And, and so I know there's a lot of work on that, like looking at ways to exclude lamprey from moving up to, to their spawning locations. Um, that's all I know about that though. <laughs> that's okay. Then we can't know everything, right? Yeah. Um, I know we've got lots of questions. I'm trying to keep up with them all. Uh, do mud puppies inhabit fast moving streams or slow moving or both? Is there a distinction? 
Yeah. So they're in river and lake, um, habitats. So that's one of the interesting things that came out of the genetic results was that, I mean, maybe unsurprisingly, right. The ones that are in lakes appear to be much more genetically differentiated, probably just because of course they're fully aquatic. And so you're not going to have any movement of individuals between a river and an inland lake. And so there's just been time, right. For them to get more and more different from each other. Um, but whether or not that uh, has kind of led to differences in terms of like adaptations to those habitats. That's a really cool question. Um, you know, doing some sort of like common garden or experiment where you, you put them in the same type of environment and see how they do would be really interesting, but I don't know anyone that's done that work. Hey, somebody that's on the call. There you go. There's your there you research go. project. Future <laughs> PhD project. <laughs> um, so Jenny says that there are no glow sticks on the F W S set lines. Um, but then someone else also asked about glow sticks since this is really kind of a cool <laughs> idea. Uh, I assume that they control the glow sticks for color or use a particular color for glow sticks. Yeah. You know, the papers I've seen with imbistomatids, they've actually, there are a couple that have looked at that, that have had different colors of them. Um, I don't recall any strong effects of color. Um, and I don't really even know why, right. Why are they, why are they in, of interest? What is, what is it that the salamanders are, are going after there? Um, something shiny, something light, like a moth to a flame, maybe. Right. Yeah. The folks in Minnesota were using, um, just kind of the standard, like yellowy greeny color. Um, hmm. and I think, uh, Krista, who's with the DNR there again, just, you know, I think they were, they were just putting them in because they had them and why not, but they, they didn't feel like they were having a really strong effect. Again, that Colby Jack cheese, that's where to go. So <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Katie. Uh, that's all that we have time for. Email Katie uh, with all your questions and I'm sure she'll get back to you. So yeah, I'll put my, uh, you. my email in the chat here. So thanks Perfect. so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.